You, you look uh, so serious. Some of you must look sad. Don't you know the news yet? Or don't you believe it yet? Oh, I know those feelings so well. I was so confused at first. Until I met him. Then everything changed. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the first time I met him. That was different. Although, in a way, the same. You see, it also changed confusion into joy. <laughs> I'm sorry. You've got no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Okay, let me start again. Let me start again. It's all about Yeshua. Jesus. My Savior. My deliverer. You know, he was born in such a strange way. His mother and Joseph were in Bethlehem for the census that had been commanded by the Romans. Well, there was no place in the inn. So they ended up in a stable. Yes, Jesus was born in a stable lying in a manger, and yet a host of heavenly angels came out to declare his birth. Wow! When he grew up, God's favor was upon him, and he spread so much love and concern all around him. He touched so many people with healings, with deliverance. And yet, when he spoke, his words were just as beautiful as his healings. Words of life they were. And then, then the day came that I met him. And it changed my life too. Up until that day, my life had been a nightmare, torment, darkness, confusion, fear, so much fear. But then when Jesus touched me, the demons that lived within me just had to leave. And suddenly, I felt lighter, and joy welled up where the demons had left an empty space. Joy! I hardly recognized the feeling. It was, it was as if a curtain of dark clouds was slowly lifted up from me, and color and light became visible again. And then, <laughs> I can still remember it. I, I felt so clean. I just felt so clean. He cleansed me. I looked up very slowly, and I saw his face for the first time. And there was so much love shining for me. For me, a wretch. And I have loved him ever since. I just followed him wherever he went. I wanted so badly to serve him, to give him something in return for what he had given to me. Oh, life on the road with him. Not always easy. <laughs> but it was so, so exciting. Up, 
up until that last week before his death, then the cracks started to appear. He spoke about his death before, yes, but we didn't understand. Or maybe we didn't want to understand. It's easier, isn't it, not to face the things that are frightening? But when Mary came out with this flask of precious ointment, all of us felt strange. We knew something was going on. Yes, we did know as well that the hatred of the religious leaders against him was increasing constantly. The tension was there. We were even worried about going to Jerusalem for the Passover. But this time, at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, was supposed to be a time of lovely fellowship. Just being together. But then Mary came. And when she opened the flask, first only a few drops came out. But a fragrance filled the whole room. And everyone became silent. Then impatiently, she broke the whole flask open and just poured the content over Jesus. And when Judas, who was the treasurer, accused her of wasting money, I mean, this ointment was worth more than a year's wages. It was Yeshua himself who defended her. And he spoke about his funeral. He knew what was going to happen. The disciples told me later about that last supper that they had with him. They said how he, the master, washed their feet as if he was a servant. This was after they squabbled about who was going to do it. Oh, they felt so ashamed. They were confused, completely confused, when he said during the meal that one of them would betray him. And of course, everybody denied that that would ever happen. But it did. Judas betrayed him with a kiss and they took him captive in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, it's a beautiful place. Jesus loved to go there with his, his disciples and teach them. He also loved to go there to be alone and pray. Now it will always be remembered as the place where cowards took him prisoner. Some of the disciples came to tell us the news, what happened. We were terribly alarmed. But at that point, we still didn't think that they would really kill him. I mean, up until now, he always escaped when danger came close. But when I saw him hanging on that cross, I had to believe it. Oh, he suffered so badly. I saw the blood flowing down his battered body. And there was nothing that I could do. I looked around me, but from his disciples, only John was there. Oh, not even Peter, who had boasted that he would die for Jesus. But then in that terrible night, after he was taken captive, denied him three times, when people recognized him as having been with Jesus. 
But you know, I wonder if I would have been braver. And I, I was there. And from the moment he set me free, I'd served him. But now, when he needed me most, there was nothing I could do for him. Absolutely nothing. And there on that cruel, shameful cross, he died. And I felt as if I died with him. My whole world just fell apart. Oh, all my joy disappeared. I could only groan because it felt like someone cut open my heart. And nothing made sense anymore. I mean, my Jesus, who was only love and goodness, had been tortured until his whole body was a battered mess. And then they put him on a cross and they killed him. And in my mind, I just kept hearing the words that he cried out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as they echoed within me, they became my own cry. My Jesus, my Jesus, why did you need to die? Why did you not come off that cross and save yourself? But there was no answer. Only a deadly silence. Joseph and Nicodemus, two influential followers of Jesus, received permission from the authorities to take his body off the cross. Because he died already, the soldiers did not break his bones, as was the custom. But it sure looked as if everything else was broken. They cleaned him and carefully wrapped him in fine linen. And then they carried him to a new grave that belonged to Joseph. Nicodemus brought some spices. But it was almost Shabbat. Shabbat, first for Passover, then the other Shabbat that was the normal Shabbat. Nothing could be done during those days. So they placed him in the grave and then put a big rock in front of the entrance. Later on I heard that the religious leaders had asked for the rock to be sealed, for a guard to be placed in front of it. For they were scared that the disciples would steal his body. Now he was dead. And they were still afraid of him. I don't remember much of what happened after that. We were so exhausted. I just wanted to sleep. I wanted to escape the nightmare that I suddenly found myself in. But when I slept, the dreams came. And in my dreams, it was as if nothing had happened. We were still walking along the countryside with Jesus. Hottest time of the day, we were sitting in the shade, listening to his teaching. And I saw his hands, so full of compassion, reach out and healed the sick. But when I woke up, I found myself in a gray, gray world. First, there were normal sounds from outside. A dog barking, a voice calling. But slowly I realized things were not normal. 
And I felt that my soul rise again, and I knew the end of my world had come. And I wondered how the everything outside just could go on the same. Yesterday, yesterday there had been earthquakes, dramatic darkness. But now, now it was as if nothing had ever happened, except that Jesus had died and I didn't know how to go on living in a world without him. Again, I kept hearing that cry. Ali, Ali, the ma, Samachtani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was on the morning of the third day that we went to the grave before the sun even rose. The streets of Jerusalem were still dark and empty as we walked up to his body with more spices. I was hardly aware of the others with me. Grief still wrapped me in a state of shock. I I vaguely remember that we talked about the problem of the big stone, but we decided to just go ahead. Maybe the soldiers would help us to remove it. And as we walked into the Garden of Joseph, the first sunlight rose above the horizon. What we didn't know is that the sun of righteousness had also risen. But we felt the earthquake that came with it. And we became even more frightened and confused. And then I saw it. The stone. The stone had been rolled away. And to me it seemed as if one disaster just happened after another. And without looking, I ran back to the city. Sobbing all the way, I went to the house where the disciples were. And I told them what I'd seen. Simon Peter and John came straight away with me. But I was tired. I couldn't keep up with them. So by the time I arrived, they had already left again. And I just stood there. And I could not stop the tears from streaming down my face. And as I wept, I walked closer to the tomb and I looked inside. And I saw two angels there. But isn't it strange that it didn't impress me one bit I was so numb inside that nothing could shock me anymore. The angels asked me why I was crying. And I told them it was because they'd taken my Lord away and I didn't know where he was. And then I heard a sound behind me. And when I looked, I saw a man standing there with the sunlight behind him. And this man asked me the same question. Woman, why is it that you're crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, I thought maybe he would know what had happened. And so I said, sir, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where he is. If you know where he is, would you please tell me? I will go and get him. And then, then he spoke my name. 
And no one, no one ever spoke my name like that. Mary, he said. Mary. And I fell down on my knees as I cried out, Rabuni! And I wanted to cling to him, hold on to him forevermore. But he wouldn't allow me to do that. Instead, Yeshua gave me a task again. I could serve him again. He said, go to my disciples and tell them, I'm going to my father and their father, to my God and their God. I could serve him again. I ran back to the city yet again, but this time, even though I was crying again, it was for joy. Once in a while I even jumped for joy. I was so excited. When I came to the house, I burst in and I shouted, He is alive! He is alive! Jesus is alive! I've seen him! <laughs> Do you think they would believe me? Of course not. They thought I was hysterical with grief. But as the day went on, they had to believe me. So many other reports came. I said the same thing. I still remember how at the end of the day, our friends came all the way back from Emmaus. And they also came in couldn't contain themselves. Jesus is alive. We walked with him. We spoke with him. We didn't even recognize him until at the last moment. He is alive. And there, as we were all excited beyond words, there stood Jesus himself in our midst. And he said, Shalom, peace be with you. Yes, I believe, I believe that he died and he rose again and he's now sitting at the right hand of God. For 40 days, he appeared to so many of us. Over 500. And then he went back to his father in heaven as the disciples looked on until there was a cloud and they couldn't see him anymore. But he didn't leave his followers alone. Ten days after that, the promised Holy Spirit came. Jesus had spoken about him so often and the father sent him. And when the Spirit came, there was so much power that that day, 110 believers became th over 3,000 as Peter preached the message of the good news. That power was given so that the commission of Jesus could be fulfilled. He said, go into the whole world. Preach the good news and then make people my disciples. That's why I've come to you today, to tell you this good news. Oh yes, all my questions have been answered. I know why he died. He died so that the sins of all mankind could be forgiven. It's a free gift. His blood that flowed so badly cleanses us from all sin. But you know how it is with a gift. It only becomes yours if you accept it. The gift can be in the hands of the giver, but until you accept it, it's not going to be yours. He rose again so that we could all have eternal life with him. What a gift! Make sure you accept it.
I have no questions anymore. I followed him forever and ever. Now I want you to do the same. Do the same. Your life can be changed completely. And then, after you have become followers, do what he told you to do. Go out. Spread the good news. And make sure that people like me, who are in torment, who are confused, who are fearful, hear that good news and become new. That's what he promised. And there is an eternal life for us forevermore in the kingdom of light. No darkness there ever. There's a kingdom of light. So I leave that with you, that message. And I also leave with you his peace. Shalom. May his peace be with you forever.